Welcome to the Family Research Council. I want to say a word of welcome also to those joining us online. This is um, webcast live and will be available to view afterwards on frc.org. My name is Kathy Roos and I'm the Senior Legal Fellow here at the Family Research Council. Um, and it's an honor for me to bring you this fine panel of experts to discuss a very important topic, transgender ideology in public schools, parents fight back. Most people believe that gender and sexuality issues are family matters, not to be mandated by party politics. But unfortunately, the Fairfax County School Board is out of step with most people. Even before the Obama administration evolved on transgenderism, the Fairfax County School Board voted 10 to 1 to make showers, locker rooms and bathrooms, and sports teams, and even hotel rooms on overnight trips open to the opposite sex, students who claim a gender contrary to their biology. The board first mentioned its plan to make these blockbuster changes at a meeting on April 23, 2015. Parents after that requested a public hearing on the issue. They were denied. Board member Elizabeth Schultz called for a delay. She was voted down. The board voted on this policy just two weeks later, two weeks after making the announcement public. It was not pretty. Videos of that meeting show an overflow crowd of several hundred parents, um, some shouting to be heard as board members scolded them and told them they were on the wrong side of history. Now, the board assured the public that nothing would change, that this measure was necessary to counter harassment and discrimination of transgender students, and that the amendment was required by law. As it turns out, all of these things were untrue. And let me say by way of introduction, too, the reason why we're looking at Fairfax County is that it's one of the largest in the nation, and it is, its proximity to Washington, D.C. makes it sort of a proving ground for issues like this, unfortunately. Um, Many uh, lawmakers in Washington take a close look at what happens to their neighbor in Fairfax County. Um, and so it makes sense for us to look at Fairfax. So as I said, there were these claims made by the Fairfax County School Board, none of which was true. Number one, following the change in policy, the school board added gender identity and sexual orientation to the Students' Rights and Responsibilities Handbook a book that all students and their parents are required to sign every year. The sex ed curriculum was also changed. This is the second nothing will change um, matter. Uh, among the numerous examples of age inappropriate and excessively graphic material that goes well beyond what's required by Virginia state law are lessons that speak of children being assigned the sex male at birth, but who really have a gender identity of female. The lessons include people who transition to living and presenting themselves as the gender that matches their gender identity." End quote. Second point, there was no record of harassment of transgender identifying students prior to the policy changes or afterwards. A Freedom of Information Act request was filed by a concerned parent seeking information about how many discrimination complaints had been filed by students or staff who identify as transgender. The board was legally required to respond, and its response was that there were no documents relevant to the requests. A year after these sweeping policy changes, the Obama administration issued its transgender school directive. And the Fairfax County Board said, see, these changes are legally necessary. But legal experts refuted that claim. Then a federal court enjoined the Obama letter. And now, of course, the Trump administration has rescinded it. But still, in Fairfax and in many other counties, these policies remain. Notably, the school board was sued for illegally creating a new identity category inconsistent with state law. Attorney Josh, Josh Hetzler will likely speak on this. Um, the case was recently dismissed for lack of standing. Now, the LGBT lobby heralds this as a great victory, but this case leaves wide open the possibility of future lawsuits against school boards like the Fairfax County School Board, as long as there's proper standing. A transgender advocate was hired secretly by the school board to develop best practices for system-wide implementation of these policies. 
The school board refused to disclose his name. Parents learned his name on a gay rights website. And we learned more about him. But yet the board still refuses to disclose their, his report to citizens or even to fellow board members. Now his recommendations may have appeared in draft regulations that were released last summer that included, among other things, the creation of affirmation teams of teachers and other administrators to help students transition from one gender to another. But in a surprising victory for Fairfax parents, on the eve of the vote to implement these regulations, the vote was canceled. Nevertheless, over, the overall policy remains in full effect and is being implemented school by school, right down the road. Now, for two years, board members have heard from angry parents who sign up to speak at their biweekly board meetings. I am one of those parents. We have tried to point out the real impact these policies have on real kids and real families and the un unintended consequences. And that is the focus of our discussion today. I am so pleased to introduce the speakers we have for you this afternoon. What I'll do is read a bit from each of their biographies and then we'll proceed with their remarks one after another. First, we will hear from school board member Elizabeth Schultz, who has fought district bureaucrats and the rest of the school board practically alone for three years. Ms. Schultz is serving a second term on the board for the 10th largest school district in the nation. She received the first STAND Award by Bishop E.W. Jackson at the National Awakening Conference and has received the Courage in Leadership Award by the Virginia Christian Alliance for Integrity in Education Policy and for Protecting Students' and Parents' Rights. Next, we will hear from Meg Kilgannon, a parent of children in the Fairfax County School System and Executive Director of Concerned Parents and Educators of Fairfax County, a 1,000-plus member-strong organization of parents and citizens advocating for common-sense, family-friendly curriculum and policies. Ms. Kilgannon also serves as Operations Director for ParentAndChild.org, a parent research group that evaluates sex ed in Fairfax County and informs parents about content and, importantly, their right to opt out. Our final speaker is Josh Hetzler, a legal expert who has traveled the state speaking at school boards and providing draft legal guidance letters. Mr. Hetzler is legislative counsel for the Family Foundation of Virginia, a state policy organization that advocates for life, marriage, and parental authority, religious liberty, and constitutional government. Over the past year and a half, since this issue has gained national attention, Mr. Hetzler has become intricately involved with both the policy and legal efforts at the state and local levels. Ms. Schultz. Oh, we ask you to come to the podium. I didn't make that clear. Didn't know that. Thank you. Isn't it uh, sitting is the new smoking, so it's better that we stand? So, <laughs> so forced, forced standing. So first of all, I want to thank you for the um, invitation to speak today. Um, I do want to make clear, because I am a um, sitting elected official, that I am here in my individual capacity. I don't represent um, the board in any way, um, but uh, have been invited uh, to speak on this issue and, um, and appreciate the opportunity to go and speak um, and a good dialogue, uh, frankly, just about wherever I'm invited. Um, I wanted to note that governing school systems, particularly large and complex school systems like Fairfax County, requires a systemic assessment of impact prior to implementing any large-scale change, whether you're talking about curriculum development, discipline reform, high school start times, there's always an approach to assess the problem at hand. What is the nature and what is the scope of the problem that is being presented to a board of governors like the Fairfax County School Board and how are you going to go about addressing it? 
What is the solution that is being presented by your staff or by the community that is being sought to resolve the issue at hand? What community engagement is going to be done? What are the governance policies or regulations that are in place which would need to be changed or created in order to affect the change that's being presented? When boundary changes for a indi individual school are brought to our, uh, our board, for example, it often takes more than 18 months to engage the community and assess the impact of what will happen for future children in the pipeline, whether or not you're going to um, incorporate any grandfathering of existing children, whether you're going to move children, um, and how long such a boundary will take. In addition, when you do something like high school later start times, that was an effort that took a decade in Fairfax County, a full decade of engagement, multiple consultants over time revisiting the issue and understanding the complex impacts that it would have in, frankly, uh, the school district that sits in the nation's worst traffic. So those are the types of examples where the nature and the scope of the problem are well explained by staff to a board and there is an uh, extensive community engagement in order to ultimately arrive at a solution. It is of significance to note that from origination to full implementation of the adoption of gender identity within Fairfax County happened within a matter of weeks. Those few weeks that were on the calendar led to no community engagement, there was no scoping of the problem, there was no assessing of what and benchmarking to best practices within Fairfax County, within the Commonwealth of Virginia, or frankly anywhere else um, in the country. When you look at a, a situation where you are implementing a change for 187,000 students, 40,000 employees, which makes with the combination of full-time and part-time employees, Fairfax County the largest employer in the Commonwealth of Virginia, you are setting education policy on its end when you embark on such changes without ever having engaged the public or understanding the, the nature and the scope of the problem at hand. We, um, as a board, um, did what I call a race to embrace. There was a uh, ideological or political objective to be obtained rather than to assess the legal implications, the mental health and wellness of our students, the safety and security, the facility impact. And for example, uh, New York uh, City, I saw, just implemented a law that by January of 2018, every single school has to have single, um, single sex uh, uh, facilities for bathrooms, s single occupancy and the capital needs that would go into that, I can't even begin to imagine the cost of the capital needs. In Fairfax County, our capital uh, um, renovation plan has a 30-year benchmark to achieve all of the capital needs that are currently within the system. That's well beyond um, you know, being able to just, on the turn of a dime on six months notice, turn um, and create single-sex facilities. Quickly, this issue became polarized. Um, that is the unfortunate part um, about this. Rather than focusing on the underlying issue, which actually was how to best address and how to meet the needs of individual students, how to practice good governance, what, um, what the needs at the educational, mental health, and wellness of each individual student are that we meet in every other respect, and, and what we were going to do um, in terms of either changing, stopping, ceasing, or doing um, new things in all 196 schools. Uh, to this date, um, th our board has never had a data-driven discussion about how to meet with compassion appropriately the educational needs of every individual child who comes across our transom. Our school system is left as um, a, a bellwether, as a warning that in, school boards govern in our country a nexus of issues that involve education, curriculum rigor, immigration, taxes, housing, all of this comes together um, at a time where we were handed um, weeks of a politicized issue. 
And it is unfortunate that this becomes uh, the example to other school systems about how to go about handling and meeting um, a very highly charged emotional issue like this. It isn't that uh, the board or some members of the board, including myself, did not want to meet the needs of individual students, but you cannot shove down the throat of a system, parents, employees, um, fellow students, the issues related to um, gender identity in bathrooms, in locker rooms, on athletic teams, on hotel trips, um, on overnight trips, all as came in the uh, Obama administration's Dear Colleague letter a full year later. All of these um, implications were addressed by the Fairfax County School Board a year in advance of the Obama's Dear Colleague letter. And if, if we were not able to answer them a year later, how would we be able to answer them in the spring of 2015? To this date, we still cannot answer them. To this date, um, uh, individuals and organizations on both sides of this issue are unsatisfied with never having seen a consultant report, with not understanding how even today the needs of students are being met, um, both the needs of students who are presenting with uh, gender identity uh, issues and uh, parents who are concerned about the safety and security of their students, particularly in um, revelation of what happened across the river uh, in, um, in Maryland in the Rockville rape case. So there are very significant um, implications for parents to this day, for taxpayers to this day, for educators to this day, and for members of the board about how to practice good governance. And we haven't done it. So thank you. Good, good, good afternoon. My name is Meg Kilgannon. I'm executive director of Concerned Parents and Educators of Fairfax County. Two years ago this Sunday, the school, the school board in Fairfax County voted to allow boys who feel like girls to use showers, locker rooms, bathrooms, and hotel rooms previously reserved for girls only. And I was stunned. How could something so very extreme have happened? And how was it done in two weeks? Um, I, I'm a mom with, with four children, three are still in Fairfax County Public Schools, and I know that it took 10 years, countless public meetings, surveys, and impact studies to change the school start times to allow high school kids to start school later than elementary school kids. How was this done in two weeks? The massive violation of public trust by our school board, with one notable exception, really cannot be overstated. This happened in Fairfax, and it can happen where you live. So someone needs to do something about this, and that someone is you. You're the person who has to make a stand. This issue scares away most politicians. People don't want to talk about gender identity. They don't want to think about it. They want it to go away, and they want someone else to do something about it. But there is no cavalry coming. You are the one who has to make a stand. And when you do, other people will join you, and together you'll be a force to be reckoned with. Thank you to the Family Research Council for providing a place where we can meet and map out the stepping stones to change. Because someone should do something, and that someone is you. I'm going to explain what we've done in Fairfax County to take a stand against our out-of-touch and out-of-control school board. I'm going to lay out a five-point plan for parents that could be used anywhere in the country. And I'm going to explain three non-negotiables for success. I'll talk about this as it relates to Fairfax, but you could take this anywhere. It's not rocket science. It's stuff that people talk about but never actually do. When you take this issue on, you will be in the line of fire. And if you avoid these three pitfalls, the non-negotiables, you won't be loading the gun for the other side to aim back at you. First pitfall, or first non-negotiable, divide and conquer. For all its recent success, the LGBT alliance is fragile. Trans activists need the gay rights movement to help legitimize them. Gender identity on its own is a bridge too far. Separate the T from the alphabet soup. America is not ready to give 15-year-old girls double mastectomies because they feel trapped in their bodies. No one can fault you for wanting to wait a hot minute before we put eight-year-olds on hormone, block hormone blockers to block puberty from happening when these pharmaceuticals have never been tested on children, they have unknown long-term side effects, and they're potentially sterilizing and possibly cancer-causing. 
Consider the 1950s lobotomy fad in psychiatry and compare that to this situation. The science is far from settled on gender identity. The trans and the gender identity movement are a tough sell, so focus on that issue, gender identity. Divide and conquer. Number two, never ever attack LGBT people. Don't attack trans people, and don't attra attack the parents of trans children. We are all struggling to get along in this mean old world, and personal attacks are not nice. It's not what we're about. Every human person has dignity, and that dignity must be respected. Um, attacking elected officials, of course, they're fair game, right? <laughs> but if you attack trans people, you become the proof that they need the protections they demand. So don't fall into that trap. Don't play the victim card, because in this culture war, they are the bullies, not the victims. So focus on gender identity, never ever attack LGBT people, and if you can help yourself, don't use religious arguments. It's just not effective. There's a mentality that people of faith should go to religious schools and get out of public schools. And that's wrong, of course, because public schools are for everyone. But no one wants to hear predictable morality arguments. I'm a Catholic convert. I teach natural family planning. I have strong beliefs, and I love my beautiful Catholic faith. But what is more relevant to most people is a case based on biology and reason. Secular arguments are perceived as more inclusive and open the door to many other people who really want to engage on this issue. It's all hands on deck, and we need help from as diverse a coalition of people as we can assemble. <clears throat> I've been working with a group of women in an organization called Hands Across the Aisle Coalition, and it, that proves that there's a broad opposition to gender identity if you can leave the religious talking points to the side. The feminists in our group make eloquent arguments that gender identity is the ultimate misogyny and it's the erasure of women. Lesbians in the group are concerned that transing masculine girls is a kind of lesbian eugenics. And guess what? All the women in this group agree that gender identity is bad, pornography is a scourge, prostitution should never be called sex work or legalized. Who knew we agreed on so much? Once we get gender identity taken care of, I hope we're going to get to work on those issues. But for now, please remember the three non-negotiables. Focus on gender identity. Never attack trans people or LGBT. And don't talk about religion. So what can you do? Here comes the five-point plan, right? Educate, explain, engage, empower, and elect. We want to engage first. As a wife and a mother, I have so many things that I could be doing right now, and so do our volunteers. Families, jobs, baseball games, piano lessons, SAT prep courses. But to protect children from these kinds of intrusions and injustices, people must engage. Go to school board meetings. Go to school board committee meetings. Talk to other parents. Talk to teachers and administrators. Start a Facebook page or a website. Follow people on Twitter. Talk to your state house representatives and congressmen. Explain to these people that it's just not reasonable to let men into intimate spaces reserved for women. You have to be the adult in the room. Number two, educate. Educate yourself by learning about this issue and all the people who lose basic human rights when gender identity rights are artificially imposed. Educate others by explaining that 0.005% of the Fairfax County student body can be accommodated in many different ways that doesn't have to include access to sex segregated spaces. There are trans activists in many states operating equality groups. We have Equality Virginia in Virginia. You need to find out if there's one in your state and whatever they've done, you need to try and undo it. I'll bet you a dollar there's an equality group in your state right now that's hosting a weekend workshop on gender identity and ministering to the trans community in a church near you sometime soon. Number three, explain. Explain that gender identity rights only come at the direct expense of others. Women, sexual abuse survivors, female athletes forced to compete against men and boys, ethnic minorities who culturally value modesty, economically challenged children who face many barriers to educational success and don't need one more, children with anxiety disorders, and on and on and on. Ask people questions to get them thinking. 
Is demanding access to private spaces necessary if other accommodations are being made? Find out what parents think about a female student on an overnight trip who objects to sharing a bed with a biological boy who identifies with a girl. Should that girl be able to complain? Because in Fairfax County, she can be punished and even expelled based on her discrimination against that person on the basis of gender identity. Instead of being respected, this young woman will be re-educated and possibly expelled. These policies are unreasonable and they're extreme. They're totalitarian. Reasonable people can come to agree on measures that accommodate everyone. Empower. Using your newfound knowledge and network of parents and activists, reach out to parents who are not aware of the issue. Our group, ConcernedParentsAndEducators.org, put together a parent information packet that had background on the issue, forms for opting out, resources for being more involved, and we have only volunteers for staff. We have no money for printing. We made the packet available on, on our web page. We promoted it on social media, earned media. We had a few flyers at back-to-school nights uh, and at PTA meetings. The group Keep Virginia Safe was also born from this debacle. Keep Virginia Safe petitioned the Loudoun County School Board when they were considering a similar gender identity measure this past winter. Some of us spoke at their school board meeting. Prince William County has a vote looming in June of this year, and we're ready to help our neighbors in any way possible. Number five is elect. When, the ele when is the next election for your school board? Who are candidates that share your views? You need to elect candidates that share your views and you need to hold them accountable once they're in office. Donate to a school board candidate, host a fundraiser in your home, even a simple meet and greet for a candidate I'm sure would be welcome. Get involved in the planning and execution of a successful race. Think of friends and neighbors who'd be great candidates in 2019 in Fairfax County. We need people who are not part of the educational industrial complex to become involved. We don't need any more teachers on the school board, but we could use a few more parents. We need accountants to follow the money. We need business leaders who know the value of education for the entire community. We need lawyers to revise regulations, ex-military officers who have the skills to manage an organization in crisis. Conservatives aren't known for their activism in education unless it involves inner city charter school programs or voucher programs, and those are great and worthy endeavors. We have $2.8 billion a year in Fairfax County that's being spent by truly ideological liberals. Why are we letting the left spend all that money? Because Republicans don't play the small ball. Maybe you should seriously consider running because someone should do something about this and that someone is you. So engage, educate, explain, empower, and elect. Um, get to work. With a small group of very dedicated volunteers, you will quickly grow into a much larger group of parents who are engaged and then what can stop you? Uh, it's really going to take you. This advice is enough to get you started. It's a little vague because we're in public and I don't want to divulge any trade secrets. But please contact me if you'd like to talk about your particular situation. I'm happy to help. And just remember, someone needs to do something about this, and that someone is you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today. My name is Josh Hetzler. I'm the Legislative Counsel with the Family Foundation of Virginia. And I believe this is a very exciting time in the law in particular. There are a lot of things happening that we haven't seen before in this, in this way. When it comes to the, this issue, uh, Virginia really has been the epicenter of, of the whole issue in many ways. A lot of people think about North Carolina, and certainly they've had a lot going on. But as their bordering state, um, from a legal front and sort of in, in the school boards in particular, uh, there's been a lot going on. The Gloucester case, which is uh, out of Gloucester, Virginia, that went up to the Supreme Court and recently was sent back down after the, the uh, Trump order reversing a, a previous uh, guidance document or Dear Colleague letter. So that has been ongoing in the courts and has sort of served as the, the national case for this issue. Additionally, on the state level, we have the Fairfax 
uh, case, actually the case of Lafferty versus Fairfax County Public Schools um, that I believe uh, Kathy spoke about. And that concurrently has been making its way up to the Supreme Court all the way, all the while the Gloucester case has been making its way to the Supreme Court. So for the past year, we've seen these uh, cases getting up to the highest courts um, in the respective lands. Right? And um, so, and not only that, but as we've heard, fa the significance of Fairfax having over a million uh, residents is, and I think the 10th largest school in the uh, school system in the country really has been a test case. And, but it hasn't just been Fairfax, it's been uh, its neighbors in Loudoun and Prince William. And there have been other uh, counties throughout Virginia. And the Family Foundation really has been there uh, from the beginning, being a part of this, meeting with, with pastors, meeting with parents. Uh, we've been truly encouraged uh, by some of the, the great folks in Virginia um, what they're doing, there are some outstanding school board members that are working with us. There are some outstanding parents who are really doing the grassroots work because uh, that's what it, that's really what it takes. Um, we, we began with meeting um, a number of uh, pastors and parents in the Gloucester decision and have done that in various parts of the state. We've sent letters to school boards informing them uh, as to what the law is. So there's been a lot of confusion about what the, what the law is. And depending on who you talk to, you're going to hear totally different things. Um, but uh, the, the issues here, and we could spend all day talking about the, the legal nuances, and I hope maybe we'll get into some of that in the question and answer time. But really, we've got two, two issues. On the federal level, we've got the Title IX issue. Uh, specifically the education amendments of 1972 in, uh, to the to title nine wherein uh, the administration or the previous administration decided uh, based on uh, the, the Department of Education sent a guidance letter which really wasn't even a guidance letter in the legal sense it was called a dear colleague letter and what they said was basically we are going to reinterpret the word sex to now include sexual orientation and gender identity. Well, that had never been done before. And um, certain, and unfortunately, in 1972, they didn't think they needed to define the word sex, right? So there was a question over whether this word was in fact ambiguous. And when it went to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, this is what the question was, was is it ambiguous? And if it is, who do we side with? Who gets deference? Is it going to be uh, the federal agency who wrote the rules, or is it going to be uh, the state or, or, or the or the um, school boards? And you know, and we've gotten some sort of back and forth rulings on this issue, and now we'll wait to see what the Fourth Circuit does now. Uh, so we have that issue, and then concurrently in Virginia we have what you may have heard as the Dillon rule. And so we've been fighting this on two fronts. We're trying to keep it, figure out what Title IX says and how it applies to everyone. And in Virginia specifically, we have this restriction on localities where um, actually I want to read you um, in Fairfax County's words what this means. Because I found out that Fairfax County a government website has a whole page devoted to what the Dillon rule is and I really like the way they describe it. It says, um, it says, like other Virginia local governments, Fairfax County has limited powers. More specifically, Virginia courts have concluded that local governments in Virginia have only one those powers that are specifically conferred on them by the Virginia General Assembly, two, those powers that are necessary, necessarily or fairly implied from a specific grant of authority, and three, those powers that are essential to the purposes of government, not simply convenient but indispensable. And I particularly like this, this line. They say it states, um, the Dillon Rule narrowly defines the power of local government. It also states that if there is any reasonable doubt 
whether a power has been conferred on a local government, then the power has not been conferred. So we're, so we're going to construe any doubts against the local government. So if there's any question, um, then it's th we're going to say they don't have the power to do that. In this case, we're going to say Fairfax County doesn't have the power to expand that which is in its non-discrimination or harassment policy to include categories that the General Assembly hasn't included in the Virginia Code. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, law doesn't, uh, the law doesn't apply itself. Right? Someone, someone must apply it. And at the federal level, we had a, a Department of Education, somebody in a, some bureaucrat in this town wrote a letter that had no force of law and said, this is what everyone in the country has to do now. And if you don't, we're going to pull all your federal funding. All right? Well, that's, that's power, except it has no force of law, but it creates fear. In Virginia, an advisory opinion was issued by our attorney general. And it was very wrong in a, num a number of ways. I, I would love to tell you all about it, but suffice it to say, the attorney general of course, said, oh, you can do this. You can do this, absolutely, ignoring, the, ignoring Virginia's Dillon rule. Of course, similarly, that advisory opinion had no force of law. But it's very expensive, and it's very hard to try to have a court say what these things are. But all that time, there was a, there was a great political, uh, as you know, this issue more than others, and I'm trying to figure out my time here. Okay, um, this issue more than others has had great political um, angst, and 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 a lot of things have have not really been about the law. Well, public officials recognize this, and a lot of them are afraid. And in the case of Virginia, our General Assembly when they had the opportunity to, to fix this, was, was unwilling to act. And uh, that has been very frustrating. But to their credit, uh, we have, like I said, had these two cases uh, vying for, their, for the Supreme Court of the United States, the Supreme Court of Virginia, and everybody just sort of waiting, what's going to happen? And during that time, this issue, I would say, I would describe it as this was hanging by a thread. And at any moment, the whole issue could, could be over because, because of the way it was beginning to infiltrate school boards over a lawless uh, letter in Virginia, uh, state and, and federal. Um, and at just the right moment, it seemed, a new administration came into town. And one of the first things they did was revoke that dear colleague letter. And that... Um, has, has made the issue sort of calm uh, for a little while. Now, things are still being worked out in, in the courts, and we're going to continue to monitor it, but there was a, a significant change there. And what, is, and, and what is our takeaway from all of this? Well, I would say the main takeaway uh, is that elections matter. Um, if, if anyone has any doubt about that, this issue is a great example about how it's, as I said previously, laws are not self-applying. The rule of law is only as good as those who enforce it and uphold it. And we have to elect those, those people. And certainly, this issue, maybe more than other, any other, to me, seems like it's the simplest thing there is. We know certain things about biology and the nature of male and female. And we've done certain things forever. I don't think anyone that really even thought about this issue before a year and a half ago. Right? It wasn't an issue. Um, but that, those things alone, truth and facts, have not been enough. They're not enough. We've got to elect people who have the right values and, and who have the courage uh, to uphold them when it's difficult because there's a lot of pressure. Um, so with that, I'm really looking forward to, to any questions you all have. Thank you for having me today.
just change my gender? <laughs> Gosh, I didn't plan that. Um, I'm asking Peter Sprigg of the Family Research Council to come up and be with us. He's senior fellow for policy studies, and he's worked on the issue of marriage, family, and sexuality for many, many years. Um, as we go to questions, um, now, we're opening up for questions. I would ask you to please state your name and affiliation before you ask your question. There will be a roving microphone, so please do wait for the microphone so that everybody that's watching online can enjoy your question. Um, I would like to start out asking the first question, um, and my question is for um, board member Elizabeth Schultz. When these policies were being debated, and really, most of the debate in Fairfax has happened after they were already established, because we had no notice and no time to object, really. Um, but since that time, of course, it's been the subject of almost every board meeting, because citizens have come and made it the subject of almost every board meeting until the general agenda uh, goes forward. Um, there have been many, 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 many unanswered questions about the impact of these policy regulations. And I'd like to ask Elizabeth specifically, at one point, I believe um, you submitted questions. I have a document here um, of, I don't know, m 10 pages of questions that have arisen from these policies that, from my perspective, none of them have been answered. Questions like, how many genders and which genders will be recognized by the school district? What are the definitions of those genders? Will the, will the district um, of Fairfax change grammar instruction to remove male and female pronouns? Um, when students or employees are applying for schools, are they, will they continue to be asked their sex or gender um, at time of registration? And if so, why? And if not, why not? And then another one, I don't know if, what will science classes teach when it comes to chromosomes? Will they censor out the lessons like the Bill Nye Science Guy program censored a minute and 12 seconds of his program on chromosomes when teaching children about how your mom gives you one X chromosome and your dad gives you an X or a Y? And if you get a Y, you're a boy. And every cell in your body has that boy chromosome or those girl chromosomes, every single cell. Is that going to be taught in Fairfax any longer? So if Elizabeth could just speak on maybe the unanswered questions, or maybe some have been answered. Uh, I, will, I will say that, so from a governing perspective, this is where the, the governance role of a school board has to necessarily step away from hyper-politicization of the education of children. And, and when there is an ideology behind an action, um, the ideology is driving the conversation instead of what are the reasonable practices that are going to be entertained or ceased or changed as a result of whatever the change, you know, is before the board. And um, you're exactly right. The, um, there are many questions. And, you know, I'll, I'll just read a couple of others because this is, this is really where um, – while it's very easy for one side to um, demonize or label or um, uh, cast invective into the conversation, the reality is is that there are some some pretty basic questions um, that have to be answered when you're educating children. Things like um, you know whether a student would need to present anything from a medical doctor. Um, in order to present with an alternative uh, gender or gender identity. Um, this is something that was just debated very heavily in France, and um, actually uh, they're, going, they're going the opposite direction, which is uh, in France they're basically saying now you really don't need any medical intervention. You don't need to be taking um, hormone replacement therapy or, or uh, undergoing any kind of transition whatsoever that you need to respect the individual from the the position that they state but the problem is is that if a student notifies the school administration that they're identifying with an alternative identity gender identity is there an obligation then on the school system to confirm that with the parents um, what if the parents aren't married 
What if the parents disagree with what the child says? What if one parent agrees with what the child does, said, but a different parent doesn't? And now is the school system thrown into you know, a familial issue with the registration of a student? Are we allowed to ask students anymore what their sex is on a registration form? That's on every registration form. Um, and if, we're, if we do, why are we doing it if it doesn't matter anymore? And if we're not, under what auspices are we not? And, and how does that conform to many other issues in federal law? Um, another issue is, is that if a, if a student does not pick and select a gender identity that is opposite of their gender identity, um, and you know it's agender androgyny if they uh, if they consider themselves gender diverse gender fluid gender independent gender neutral gender non binary gender non conforming gender queer gender transitioning gender variant intersex neither two spirit at what point um, in in their registration process or in the ministry uh, administering of their education um, how often are, is the student allowed to change? If a, if a student is quote unquote gender nonconforming, or do they have access to both sets of restrooms? Do they have access to both sets of athletic teams? Do they have access to both sets of locker rooms? And this is where the individual nature of each student um, whether the student has special needs, whether the, the student is, um, has a, a severe disability, whether the student is presenting with uh, gender identity questions, this, th there is a lot of complexity at the individual level. And so the broad brush stroke for um, a school system to simply, we're just going to acknowledge it. H how do you just acknowledge it and then actually govern it and, and operationalize it. When you look at um, the workload, we have a national teacher shortage, um, and it, it, it's profound. You have um, uh, homework issues, you have sleep issues, you have stress in um, whether or not we're going to have you know, teachers in the future even matriculating out of colleges around the country and joining the teacher profession, but then teachers are faced with, you know, um, issues that even the governing body can't seem to resolve. So what does, you know, what does a teacher with a teacher workload do with a, with a set of terms and a set of policies that aren't even made clear by their own governing body. Um, how, how do you address coaches? I mean, coaches, I mean, I don't think anybody realizes how severely underpaid um, our coach or co coaches are. They're often second career um, individuals. We have federal regulations around dividing uh, that allow sex to be divided around um, contact sports. So if there are contact sports involved and a student is identifying with a different um, gender identity, when federal law enumerates that you can in fact separate by sex, then what do you do if it becomes a contact sport? Now, and you have some states that are addressing this at the state level where there is a state level of athletics. So some states are allowing contact sport um, gender identity uh, crossover students, and some states aren't. And what happens when that presents here? So then this becomes a coach's problem, an administrator's problem, a teacher's problem at an individual level when we haven't settled, as Josh mentioned, we haven't settled the, the legal implications, we haven't settled the regulatory um, implications at an individual uh, board level, and education should return to the, to the lowest level, but if we can't have have these conversations without the invective, without um, labeling, then we're never going to be able to govern and it's always going to be, you know, effectively a hot mess. Let me, thank you. Um, do we have a question from the audience? Because I have a lot of them if you don't. <laughs> Anybody? We have a roving, okay. Let, wait for the mic if you would and then identify yourself. I'm Robert Bigby. I've been a Fairfax teacher for 18 years now. Um, I remember back in... Do you have an association beyond uh, my that? My association is FCPS Pride. I'm the, uh, the president of the LGBT Employees and Parents Group. Thank you. Um, uh, I remember back in 2002 when sexual orientation was a question uh, for non-discrimination, and it was voted down. Um, uh, speakers to the school board and a school board member, if I recall, uh, suggested 
that there be separate bathrooms for gay and lesbian teachers and students because it made people uncomfortable or, or it might be unsafe. My question to the Fairfax people here is, are you still suggesting that? Uh, my assumption is that you're not, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, my other question is, if you're not, how is this, how is separate bathrooms for transgender students different? I just, you can volunteer unless it's directed to a certain person. Well, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm assuming um, Mr. Rigby is um, well known um, in Fairfax. Uh, I'm assuming that that may be directed to me. I wasn't on the school board in 2002. I actually don't ever even recall hearing that. So that's news to me. Um, uh, that was a very long time ago, and um, it sounds like it's somewhat conflating the issue because um, a, a, a lesbian or uh, gay individual using um, a bathroom that conforms to their actual sex is not what's at question. It, what's at question are you know, the, the myriad of issues that we've enumerated here today, which are, you know, what do you do about um, students that are gender fluid, gender nonconforming, gender transitioning, gender queer? I mean, the, it, 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 the, the real issue is, what do you do about bathrooms, intimate space facilities? Um, Palatine um, uh, School District is the perfect example. Um, that school board made every effort to accommodate um, a male who identified as female and um, in fact you know all the way to the locker room and the only accommodation they put up was a shower curtain and that wasn't good enough um, the shower curtain had to come down and federal government under threat of losing federal funds um, brought the hammer down on this one small school district and if if the if the most reasonable accommodations cannot be debated in order to achieve and um, meet the needs of individual students. If it's an all or nothing policy, um, then it's going to continue to be, you know, hyperbolic. But I think that there is a place in the middle of saying, okay, you, you, you've got to conform to some degree of accommodation. And if the answer is we're never going to conform to any accommodation, we want complete access to contact sports, then you're going to have to change federal law. If you want complete access to hotel rooms on overnight trips for um, school students without parents' knowledge, I think there's going to, this is going to continue to be a major battle. So I really don't think that um, something that somebody said in 2002 that I don't even know who it was is really even a part of the discussion. That's a perfect example of when you need to just talk about gender identity, right? Focus on this issue. Don't talk about same-sex attraction. Don't talk about LGBT. We're talking about gender identity and what that means for public schools. And don't get distracted by other issues. There's a question right over here. I have a question with respect to sports. Could you identify yourself? Uh, my name is Bonnie Burkhart. I've had children go through Fairfax County Schools. Um, and it has to do with um, people being fluid with their gender. In Alaska, you had a young boy who was on the girls' track team and played one third place in the state championship on the girls' side. You have girls who are in transition who are being pumped through full of male hormones and steroids to become male and competing on teams and steroids are prohibited from sports teams um, in professional amateur um, you know venues so whether you're a boy wanting to be a girl or you're born a girl and transitioning to be a boy doesn't this kind of signify the end of female athletics um, anybody, yeah. Can comment on that because I think uh, this gets at the issue that uh, someone mentioned that there are actually um, uh, radical feminists with whom, you know, we might disagree on a lot of issues who make exactly that point. They say that uh, uh, this is the, the people who will suffer, particularly with respect to the sports issue, are biological females. The, who, who uh, will find it difficult to compete with biological males who identify as female. And um, I just want to mention one sort of 
key sort of way of thinking about this issue, it's, it's always framed by those who want to change the policies in terms of discrimination, uh, at the assumption being that somehow you are discriminating against an individual for being transgender. But what you really have is two completely different paradigms for how you define who is male and who is female. Uh, up until now, I mean, and this may change as, as the culture evolves, but up until now, most people have not challenged the idea of certain number of separate facilities and separate activities for males and females, but what they are challenging is the, how you define who is male or female. And um, I think what we're saying is that certainly, at least with respect to certain particular um, aspects of life, and sports is one of them, that a person's biological sex is a much more meaningful uh, way of dividing the human race into male and female than their gender identity. It's simply because there are biological differences between males and females which influence their speed, their strength, their effectiveness in um, athletic competition. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a very good point and I, and I think it's good that you're pointing out that if we go, if we apply this you know, not only in the classroom, but to the sports teams and so forth, it's biological females who lose. Um, I would say that um, certainly the issue of sports, and in particular contact sports, um, is is a major source of concern. Um, and in fact, it's it, the irony is, is that we're using Title IX to provide access for males to female sports teams and uh, females to male sports teams when the entire purpose for Title IX was at the outset to protect um, girls and provide um, adequate resources for girls in sports. And, you know, I grew up as a girl in sports <laughs> and um, at, at the time the Title IX came out and um, having um, participated in that and now being the mother of boys, I see um, that there, it, there is a, a real concern between not just parents of girls, but also parents of boys. Um, you know, uh, all, all four of my boys have been in contact sports. Do, do we get into um, who is allowed to tackle whom based on their gender identity? Do we get into, you know, Lance Armstrong was drummed off the world stage for the use of um, basically performance enhancing drugs and are not um, hormone replacement therapies in, in fact that and then do you get to you know girls losing scholarships to colleges who have you know their whole life you know been practicing on a soccer field or practicing in a pool um, and with the goal to further their education based on you know being um, student athletes and if if they're student athletes and and they're they provide stewardship over their academics but really it was the combination of their uh, athletics um, with their academics that was going to get them into college what what is the trajectory that we do to young girls in this country? Um, and do you do that too in things like capacity for science? You know, if, if you have a boy who transitions to a girl and has a greater facility for, um, for, for science and math, are they gonna win out a spot at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology or um, a spot in a college and a university that would have otherwise been um, acquired by a girl? So these are not, it's not to conflict or, um, uh, you know, poke an eye um, at, at any one individual. It's to say that they're very real underlying issues here, and 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 they've not been had. It's as you know the the you know we've jumped the shark as you will and put the cart before the horse of saying we must do this because it's you know the right side of history or you know it somebody proclaims to have the moral high ground. And the pragmatic side of how you operationalize these means that individual girls, individual families, individual children are going to be the targets of you know, expanding one person's rights to the point that it erodes another. Absolutely. Uh, there's a question in the back. Okay, thank you. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm Laura Miller. I'm a mom of three in Fairfax County Public Schools. I also went to Fairfax County Public School. Um, I have a lot of things to say, but I'll try to truncate it to just one thing right now. Um, 
I also worry about the athlete that wants to perform so well that they think they're a guy when they're young. Mm -hmm. And they think they want to, uh, you know, be a guy when they're young. Uh, and in today's culture might say, well, that's because you are. Here, have some hormones and you'll be fine now. And there'll be no harm to you. And I think that's incredibly dangerous to our young metamorphosing girls. Um, myself, I was a tomboy and I was a state champion athlete. And I can tell you, I had friends that creamed me still. And they wanted to reach to the top and some of them became Olympians, okay? But I can tell you, if we lived during this era, we would probably all been shuffled to the counselor's office and said, well, you need to affirm your inner feelings. We never went through a metamorphosis. I can tell you, all of us are now moms and we love it. And I'm so glad that didn't get affirmed. I think that is so dangerous and I need help from national calorie people because right now we're just like a little ragtag band militia holding out in Fairfax County <laughs> but we're getting run over I mean I only have so much time in a day I have three kids they mentioned that okay and, and we work uh, I have no money for this um, but yet I'm going against I feel like it's a national interest behind this that has been ready to do this the last 40 years and it is just steaming us over um, this is a beacon of help because um, I think it's unfair to those that haven't metamorphosed. I mean, there was just an article uh, from even the Huffington Post saying in San Francisco that children, even 21 and under, don't have brain developed enough to understand the ramifications of their actions, the risk assessments. And so they shouldn't be even criminalized or punished like adults because they're not ready for adult thinking. The brains aren't developed yet. And yet our schools are going to affirm in about a thousand different ways that you're ready to make life-altering choices to your bodies, man or young boy or young girl. I think that's just unfair to the children that haven't grown out of this. I think any doctor or any parent that allows that to happen ought to be examined. They're the ones, not the children. Uh, that's, but I'm asking for help from the schools to, to say, not 18 and under, let them grow up. And I'm asking help from the national people. We need a Calvary to come in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Peter, oh. would you? <laughs> that's, that's terrific. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not the Calvary, but uh, let me use that as an opportunity to plug a couple of resources that we do offer here at Family Research Council. And I'm sorry I didn't uh, uh, think until it's too late to put these out on a table. Uh, but we have a book called the A Parent's Guide to the Transgender Movement in Education. It, uh, I have some copies with me. If you want to just approach me afterwards, I can give them to you. And uh, it's available online on our website at frc.org. Uh, advice uh, similar to that that, uh, that Meg gave earlier, but uh, maybe a few more details. We have, as far as the, um, as far as the knowledge about the larger transgender issue. We have a major paper that was published two years ago called Understanding and Responding to the Transgender Movement, which um, I co-authored with Dale O'Leary, a freelance uh, writer at, who has extensive experience writing on this subject. That's, a, I don't have, this is just the executive summary. Just the executive summary is seven pages. The whole paper is 42 pages. So um, you can find that online as well on our, at frc.org. And we have a m much condensed version called the Transgender Movement and Gender Identity in the Law, which is kind of a, a, a condensed uh, talking points on understanding this issue, the overall transgender issue, both the, both the science and the public policy. I do have a few copies of that with me as well, so I hope those will be helpful to local activists. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. I, um, um, let's do one more quick question, and then we need to close. So right up here in the front. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Reverend Grace Harley, uh, One Solitary Voice International, and I just want to thank the panel and thank FRC for hosting this. And Laura Miller, I don't know if you know me, but uh, I think we maybe spoke on the phone. Yes. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I don't know her, but we spoke on the phone. I helped with a program in the Fairfax County High School's Mental Health Day. We had a table where we gave out lots of literature. God bless you for being here. <laughs> 
this is amazing. Well, I just wanted to ask, has the school system uh, given any thought to when it comes to the sexual identity? Uh, I am a former transgender person. I, was, I lived that life for 18 years. I want to know, has the school system thought about the fact that uh, gender uh, is fluid, uh, the, the thought of being transgendered? Uh, a person could think that way, be that way as, as a 14-year-old, and then later begin to start feeling their biological uh, sex. And if so, they're not apt to say, well, I'm now uh, feeling like I'm, I'm female, but yet they, because they have already established themselves, but most importantly, sexuality and transgender uh, does not uh, coincide as far as the same, uh, making the same statement. You can be a transgendered male, but you can still want a male. You can be a transgendered female and you want to be just with a female, as in lesbianism, but you, you now have the op you've had the surgery even and I know couples who have done that you know had sex reassignment surgery to be with each other but they're now doing it in, in a mental other capacity makes no sense but I just want to know what will the school board offer to children and to follow them to see where they are in their psychological makeup because they are identifying now as say a male but yet they are in um in the in the uh, what hotel room with other males being a male, but yet they secretly inside maybe are still being female. I mean, it's it's all very confusing. But I I, I deal with this every day, and I just want to know the school board has to pay attention to to that when it comes to sexuality along with that identity because they could be total opposite. Yeah, these are um, I mean clearly you're identifying some very delicate questions, but certainly that comes to pass and has part, been part of um, some of the questions that have been asked that you know, if you are a biological male and you're identifying as a female and you're allowed access into a locker room and you're aroused, is that sexual harassment? I mean, if you post a picture, if, if somebody just hung a picture in a locker room of an aroused male in a girl's locker room, that is sexual harassment. But now an actual aroused male in a girl's locker room isn't sexual harassment. So th these are very, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it sounds funny, but it's not. I mean, these are very complex issues. You know, it, would, a, would, a, would, a, would a male who identifies as female be barred from the male athletic team? No, that's a different way to think about it. Now, now are we, if, if you have a gender identity other than, than your sex, now are you barred from participating in things that are, you know, your actual I mean, And so there are very complex things. And why, you know, it, unless this is somewhat, you know, settled in medical science, which I've not seen a single doctor come and testify to the school board in terms of, you know, where they are on the, on the medical front. Um, you know, countries are taking completely different approaches to, to gender identity. Um, you know, children are doing online, um, you know, gender um, assignments for themselves in certain countries. Um, do you do that? Do you allow that as, um, a, you know, an elementary age child um, without medical intervention um, by medical professionals to guide the mental health and wellness of a child in, in that situation. I mean, these are very complex issues. And, you know, I, I'm in a county where I have a, a, close to a $50 million budget shortage that I've got to close in the next, you know, couple of weeks. And think about, you know, are we doing professional development on gender identity to 40,000 employees? Where's that money going to come from? Um, what happens with a, a biology teacher who says, you know what, I, I choose to refrain from teaching gender identity. Do they have a a conscientious objector status as a as a science teacher to not teach this you have we addressed that so there there are significant complexities where we're we're far from arriving at a solution that we've already implemented and unfortunately now we're dealing with the with a fallout of how do you meet the needs of individual employees, individual students, um, without this hyperbolic political state that we find ourselves in um, nationally and locally. We are going to have to let that very good last word be the last word. And um, join me in thanking our panel. And I want to thank everyone for attending here and online. Um, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you.